Welcome to part three of this PowerPoint presentation. The title today is Daniel 11, 36 through 45, Atheistic and Homosexual France, Turkey, and the Eastern Question. We will be covering much in this segment so feel free to pause at any time. You might have to watch this at two or more settings to be able to soak it all up. Be sure to have your Bible, look up all the verses and Spirit of Prophecy quotes that are provided, either on the EGW uh, CD-ROM, egwwritings.org, or the cell phone app called EGW2. Okay. If you have any questions, feel free to post them in the comment section of this video PowerPoint presentation. Okay, we're going to go into prayer. Dear Lord in heaven, please be with us as we talk about this very important topic. Forgive us of our sins. Please send your Holy Spirit to be with us. Help us to get understanding and to see the truth from your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Please watch parts one to two first before proceeding on if you haven't done so already. Part one is titled Ellen White, Daniel the Revelation and the Eastern Question. Part two is Miller's Rules of Interpretation. Daniel 8 and the correct understanding of the four horns. Those are the links to watch. And there's a video on YouTube called No Vision by Don Frost. Just go to YouTube and type in No Vision Don Frost. This is a must see for everyone. Very powerful. We have as had John a message to bear of the things which we have seen and heard. God is not giving us a new message. Review and Herald, January 19th, 1905, paragraph 22. Messages that were given by that time. There are not to be new messages coming on the scene that contradict the old. The prophecies given to John in Revelation are found also in the book of Daniel. Revelation. The teachings of this book are definite. In it, the same line of prophecy is taken up as in Daniel, 8 Manuscript Release, page 413, paragraph 2. The book of Daniel is unsealed in the Revelation to John, Testimonies to Ministers, 115, paragraph 3. The things revealed to Daniel were afterward complemented by the Revelation made to John, Testimonies to Ministers, 114, paragraph 6. In other words, if a line of prophecy or a prophecy is found in the book of Revelation, it must also be in the book of Daniel. And we'll be looking more into this in just a moment. But if it's found in Revelation as a, a line of prophecy, it's also found in the book of Daniel because Revelation is the unsealing of the book of Daniel. Not all lines of prophecy end with the Roman power or papacy. Especially should Daniel and the Revelation have attention as never before in the history of our work. We may have less to say in some lines in regard to the Roman power and the papacy. Councils to Writers and Editors, page 65, paragraph 1. Evangelism, page 577, paragraph 1. And she's referring to the book of Daniel. Not every chapter in the book of Daniel and Revelation ends with the papacy. Some chapters have less to say regarding the Roman power and the papacy or they don't necessarily end with the Roman power and the papacy. Let's go to Revelation 9. Revelation 9 is all about Islam and Turkey and how God used it to be a scourge against papal Rome under the fifth and sixth trumpets, first and second woes. The first woe was 150 years, July 27, 1299 to July 27, 1449. The second woe is 391 years and 15 days, July 27, 1449 
to August 11th, 1840. And to see more about this, go to Great Controversy, page 334, paragraph 4, to 335, paragraph 1, regarding these two woes. To learn more about this, read Great Controversy, as I said before, Great Second Advent Movement by Loughborough, page 128, paragraph 2, to 132, paragraph 4. And you can find that book on the CD-ROM in the Pioneer section. Uriah Smith's book on Revelation, chapter 9. You cannot find the correct book on the CD-ROM, but I will be providing the link. Story of the Seer of Patmos by Haskell, page 162, paragraph 3, to 179, paragraph 3. And Uriah's book is called <coughs> Daniel and the Revelation. And Josiah Litch's paper, which Sister White endorses in Great Controversy, 334 to 335, his paper's titled Prophetic Expositions, Volume 2, Chapter 2 on the Fifth and Sixth Trumpets, and you can also find that on the CD-ROM in the Pioneer section. Why read Josiah Litch's paper? The record of the experience through which the people of God passed in the early history of our work must be republished. Many of those who have since come into the truth are ignorant of the way in which the Lord wrought. The experience of William Miller and his associates in the Advent message should be kept before our people. Elder Loughborough's book should receive attention. Our leading men should see what can be done for the circulation of this book. Now, Josiah Litch was one of Miller's right-hand men. He's even mentioned in Great Controversy 334 to 335 as being such. Loughborough's book talks about him. Miller's books talk about him. And other pioneer writings talk about him. According to Loughborough's book, Josiah Litch was one of Miller's associates. Go to Great Second Advent Movement, page 124. See also 1888 Materials, page 716, paragraph 3, where she says Loughborough was the man chosen to go from church to church to teach the rise and progress of the third angel's message. And in Retirement Years, page 124, paragraphs 1 and 2, she says Loughborough was sound in all of our messages. Now let's go to Revelation 11 to see a line of prophecy because remember the line of prophecy in Revelation will be found in the book of Daniel Revelation 11 let's go to verses 1 through 2 and there was given me a reed like unto a rod and the angel stood saying rise and measure the temple of God and the altar and them that worship therein but the court which is without the temple leave out and measure it not for it is given unto the Gentiles, and the holy city shall they tread underfoot forty and two months. This is referring to the papacy that would do the treading for 1,260 years from 538 to 1798 A.D. You could see about this in uh, Daniel 11, verses 30 through 35, and Uriah's book, Daniel the Revelation, on chapter 11. Revelation 11 verses 7 through 8 is homos, is atheistic homosexual France and when they shall have finished their testimony referring to the Old and New Testament the beast that ascendeth out of the bottomless pit shall make war against them and shall overcome them and kill them and their dead bodies shall lie in the street of the great city which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt where also our Lord was crucified Go to Daniel and the Revelation 264 to 268, Great Controversy 269 to 271, and 273 to 276. And a Revelation 1114 says, The second woe is past, and behold, the third woe cometh quickly. And we know the second woe is Turkey and the Ottoman Empire, and that was from. July 27, 1449 to August 11, 1840. So we have the papacy, atheistic, homosexual France, and Turkey. You could read about this in Daniel and Revelation 505, Great Controversy, page 334, paragraph 4, to 335, paragraph 1.
here is the correct link to Daniel and the Revelation 1897 correct edition and let's go to the next page to see some quotes regarding verse 14 from Revelation 11 verse 14 the second woe ended August 11th 1840 that's Uriah Smith's book, Daniel and the Revelation. In the year 1840, another remarkable fulfillment of prophecy excited widespread interest. Two years before, which would be 1838, Josiah Litch, one of the leading ministers preaching the Second Advent, published an exposition of Revelation 9, predicting the fall of the Ottoman Empire. According to his calculations, this power was to be overthrown in A.D., 1840 sometime in the month of August and only a few days previous to its accomplishment he wrote allowing the first period 150 years to have been exactly fulfilled before de Cozy's ascended the throne by permission of the Turks and that the 391 years and 15 days commenced at the close of the first period it will end on the 11th of August 1840 when the Ottoman power in Constantinople may be expected to be broken. And this, I believe, will be found to be the case. Josiah Litch in Signs of the Times, an expositor of prophecy, August 1st, 1840. And this is coming from Great Controversy, page 334, paragraph 4. Just take out your Bibles for just a moment. Revelation 9, 1 is about Muhammad coming on the scene in 606 A.D., Revelation 9.4 is his father-in-law, Abu Bekr, when he gives the laws for the Muslims. Okay, Verses 5 through 11 takes place 600 years plus years later when all the broken fragments since the day Muhammad and Abu Bekr died, all the broken fragments of Islam come together under Othman. The 150 years, starting in verse 5, doesn't take place until they have a king over them, according to verse 11. And now for the first time, they have a leader. Since Muhammad and Abu Bakr died, they have a real strong leader, bringing all the fragmented pieces of Islam together. His name was Othman, and he was under the Ottoman Empire. They don't have this king until July 27, 1299 five months 30 days in a month 150 days 150 prophetic days is 150 literal years add that to july 27 1299 it takes you to july 27 1449 verse 12 tells us one woe is past there come two more woes verse 13 the sixth angel sounded then you have a woe Verse 15 says the angels were loose, which were prepared for an hour, a day, a month, and a year. Okay? An hour is 1 24th of a day, which is literally 15 hours. 1 24th of a symbolic day, literal 15 hours. Um, a day is a year. A month is 30 days, which is 30 years. And a year is 360 days, which is 360 years. That's 391 years and 15 days. If you add 391 years to July 27, 1449, it takes you to July 27, 1840. If you add 15 days to July 27, it takes you to August the 11th. This is exactly how Josiah Litch was teaching this. At the very time specified, Turkey, through her ambassadors, accepted the protection of the Allied powers of Europe, and thus placed herself under the control of Christian nations. The ex event exactly fulfilled the prediction. Prior to August 11, 1840, the Christian nations of Europe were under the uh, submission to the Ottoman Empire and Turkey, and now Turkey is now and the Ottoman Empire is submitting to the Christian nations. So according to the Bible in the book of Daniel and the Revelation and other books, in Revelation 11 we find the following in the line of prophecy. We find the papacy, verses 1 and 2. We find atheistic homosexual France, verses 7 and 8. And we find Turkey, verse 14. God is not giving us a new message. 
Review and Herald, January 19, 1905, paragraph 22. All the messages given from 1840 to 1844 are to be made forcible now, for there are many people who have lost their bearings. The messages are to go to all the churches. So this understanding of Turkey and the Ottoman Empire was taught between these years. It's what gave the impetus to our message. That's found in 21 MR, page 437, paragraph 1. Let's go to Daniel 11, verses 36 through 37. Verse 36 and 37 tells us, And the king shall do according to his will. Make sure you read this from your Bibles. And he shall exalt himself and magnify himself above every god, and shall speak marvelous things against the god of gods, and shall prosper till the indignation be accomplished. For that that is determined shall be done. See also Daniel 8.4 and Daniel 11.3. Daniel 8.4 tells us the king of Persia did according to his will. And Daniel 11.3 tells us Greece did according to his will. Um, so we have other kings doing according to their will as well. Neither shall he regard the God of his fathers, nor the desire of women, nor any God, for he shall magnify himself above all. Notice the date 1842. This was Miller's right-hand man. We're told the messages given from 1840 to 1844 are to be repeated. What did one of our main Advent pioneers, Josiah Lidge, teach regarding these verses? Such a system as is here described was the French Revolution. It was founded in atheism. Notice the date, 1842. On the 26th of August, 1792, this power exalted himself above all religion and a decree was passed establishing atheism by law notice 1841 the date thus the king number one did according to his will asserted and claimed licentious liberty as the right of all number two he exalted himself above every god or power imprisoning the sovereign of france and setting himself up as the supreme power Number three, he spoke marvelous things against the God of gods by decreeing that there was no God and by banishing the ministers of God from his dominion. Once again, this is in 1841. Nor the desire of women. The abolition of the marriage covenant was one of the acts of the revolutionary government. And on the 6th of June, 1794, fornication was established by law and the most unbounded licentiousness prevailed. This was in 1842. What does the book Daniel and the Revelation have to say about this? And if you've read, if you've watched uh, part one, uh, we read all the quotes about this book. The king here introduced cannot denote the same power which was last noticed, and he's referring into verses 30 through 35, namely the papal power. For the specifications will not hold good if applied to that power. Now get your Bibles out for just a moment and let's prove that this cannot be the papacy in verses 36 through 39. It's France. Go to Daniel 11 verses 36 through 39. Okay. Okay, verse 36 says, And the king shall do according to his will. And he shall exalt himself and magnify himself above every god, and shall speak marvelous things against the god of gods, and shall prosper till the indignation be accomplished, for that that is determined shall be done. Okay, so in verse 36 it looks like Rome. Okay, but this is Rome's twin. Uh, well, it looks like Rome's twin. And we're going to see who exactly it is in verse 37 because it gives us more characteristics that this cannot be Rome. Verses 30 through 35 is papal Rome. Verses 14 through 30 is pagan Rome. Okay? But now verses 36 through 39 is France. And some say, well, how is France all of a sudden on the scene? Well, you have to remember in verse 31, the arms shall stand on his part. This arms or army was Catholic France. 
who stood on the part of the papacy and it was king clovis in 508 a.d that gave power to the to the papacy and had all other nations fall in line and now paganism is being replaced with papalism so from the very beginning of its inception even in 508 a.d all the way to 1798 francis is the arms and that's why in 1798 it was so easy for france to come on the scene and take the pope captive and hold him prisoner okay so verse 37 neither shall he regard the god of his fathers nor the desire of women nor regard any god for he shall magnify himself above all so i look at verse 36 as having twins dressed alike they both have green hats white t-shirts blue shorts and red tennis shoes they pull up to a parking lot of a mall um, and one goes into the bank and another twin goes into the grocery store right next door okay this is a community mall the one in the bank is robbing it and the one in the store has no idea what's taking place now the police come and the witnesses are there and when the one comes out of the store they point him as the culprit but the witnesses say no because on the hat he had white letters that said Falcons and on his white shirt he had blue letters that said America and on his shorts he had yellow letters that said Falcons and his green tennis shoes he had yellow letters that said Falcons but the twin in the store had nothing he had none of these so the twin in the store would be the papacy the twin in the bank robbing it would be France and who has extra characteristics verse 37 says he will not regard the God of his fathers so now it's a different God that they're worshiping it's not the same God that the papacy worshiped and that France worshiped prior it's a new God and it's the God of reason and they they actually become atheists at this time they don't have the desire of women nor regard any God so they're homosexual and atheistic in character now let's see what we're counseled regarding this take a declaration in the next verse nor regard any God this has never been true of the papacy what does the spirit of prophecy have to say about this France presented also the characteristics which especially distinguish Sodom intimately connected with these laws affecting religion was that which reduced the union of marriage a mere civil contract of a transitory character which any two persons might engage in great controversy page 270 paragraph 1 so any two persons might engage in would be same-sex marriage not just male and female as God ordained it but same-sex marriage she refers to France as fulfilling Revelation 11 7 through 13 in for spirit of prophecy page 190 paragraph 3 to 193 paragraph 2 so brothers and sisters if we see the papacy in Revelation 11 verses 1 through 2 we see atheistic homosexual France in Revelation 11 7 through 13 and Turkey in the Ottoman Empire in verse 14 we have to see that line of prophecy in the book of Daniel and we do verses 30 through 35 is the papacy and we know France took that power away verses 36 through 39 in Daniel 11 is atheistic homosexual France and verse 40 through 45 is Turkey which we'll be getting more into and remember we cannot contradict that which has already been established by our pioneers and by the prophet the prophet being given the testimony of Jesus which is the Word of God now let's skip to Daniel chapter 11 verse 40 let's go to Daniel 11 and verse 40 and at the time of the end 1798 shall the king of the south Egypt push at him France and the king of the north Turkey 
shall come against him France like a whirlwind with chariots and with horsemen and with many ships and he shall enter into the countries and shall overflow and pass over now why am I putting these things in parentheses because this comes from our Sabbath school quarterly in 1904 which I'll be showing you in a little bit so the time of the end is 1798 it's the time of the papal end the 1260 years the end of that 1260 we know that's from 538 to 1798 the king of the south in the previous verses was Egypt south of Palestine and push at him the hymn is the hymn from verses 36 through 39 so France is still on the scene scene and the king of the north Turkey and I'll be doing a PowerPoint part 4 called proving from the Bible Turkey's in the north the king of the north Turkey shall come against him France like a whirlwind with chariots and horsemen and with many ships and he shall enter into the countries and shall overflow and pass over so there's three entities in verse 40 there's France who continues from verse 36 through 39 there's the king of the north which at this time is Turkey because it's whoever takes over Constantinople and they did that in 1453 and you have the king of the south which is Egypt okay and remember from our previous presentation this is literal this is not spiritual or figurative horns and beasts are not being used here literal language is being used now let's go to the 1904 Sabbath School quarterly here's the link and now I'm going to show you what is in that quarterly okay we're going to lesson 11 page 31 number 2 so if you copy and paste this link go to lesson 11 page 31 pair, uh, number 2 lesson 11 the eastern question March 12 1904 and it says concluded because lesson 9 and 10 is also on the eastern question this is from the International Sabbath School Quarterly, so it went worldwide. Sabbath School lessons on the prophecies of Daniel, you know how our Sabbath School Quarterlies are. They go to all the churches. Let's see what they were teaching in 1904. Number 2, verse 40, at the time of the end, 1798. What attitude was Egypt, the king of the south, to assume towards France? How was Turkey, the king of the north, to come against France at the same time. What was to be the success of the Turkish arms in this triple war? So according to our quarterly, there was a triple war found in verse 40. Does history record such a triple war in 1798 in which these three powers were involved? Verse 40, this application of the prophecy calls for a conflict to spring up between Egypt and France and Turkey and France in 1798 which year as we have seen marked the beginning of the time of the end see Daniel 12 4 and great controversy page 356 paragraph 2 that's referring to what the time of the end is the book of Daniel is sealed until the time of the end Daniel 12 4 and great controversy page 356 paragraph 2 says it was unsealed in 1798 and if history testifies that such a triangular war did break out in that year it will be conclusive proof of the correctness of the application so it says at the time of the end in verse 40 so at that specific year we're still in the time of the end but at means at the beginning of that year that's 1798 we can't change this brothers and sisters and make this figurative and spiritual and say it was 1989 did such events take place between Egypt and France and Turkey and France the French campaign in Egypt and Syria you can find it on that Wikipedia link and the Ottoman Empire declares war on France and you can find that on that link as well France and Egypt and Syria 
French Campaign in Egypt and Syria from Wikipedia the Free Encyclopedia The French Campaign in Egypt and Syria 1798-1801 was Napoleon Bonaparte's campaign in Ottoman Egypt and Ottoman Syria. He entered the Ottoman section of Egypt and the Ottoman section of Syria and he was bringing in his troops into Egypt. The Ottoman Empire declares war on France in 1798. July 21st, 1798. Battle of the Pyramids. French victory. This battle is part of Napoleon's Egyptian campaign. Napoleon won in the Battle of Pyramids. So what happens as a result? September 11th, 1798. Notice the date. September 11th. The Ottoman Empire, headed by Sultan Selim III, declares war on France. Subsequently, Russia and the Ottoman Empire expel French garrisons from the Ionian Islands. So yes, you have the King of the South pushing at him, which is France, they're fighting against, and then you have the King of the North coming against him like whirlwind, and he beat Egypt very badly for the first time in history. I'm sorry, he beat Napoleon very badly. Did our church teach this as a whole? Where else do we find these teachings? Bible readings for the home, 1888 edition. There's the link to the book. You can copy and paste it. What does a prophecy next bring to view? This is question number three in this particular book, which I actually have a copy of my own physical copy. A king or nation which in its national capacity should take upon itself the profession of atheism. Verses 36 through 37. So this book says verses 36 and 37 is a kingdom that's atheistic. Question number four. What nation has ever taken such a position? France. And this was during the Great French Revolution, the Reign of Terror, 1793 to 1798. In the same link, what does question number 13 in the 1888 Bible readings for the Home Circle ask? Just go to the above link and notice the title of the chapter and you can see it in the link, the Eastern Question. We'll be getting into that later, a little bit later. Question, who is the king of the north? This is number 13. Now also introduced. Answer, Turkey, because it occupies the same territory everywhere else in the prophecy called the king of the north. See verses 6 through 15 of Daniel 11. It also tells us the same thing in the 1914 edition of Bible readings for the home. That was the updated edition in their day. Look what we're counseled regarding the 1888 Bible readings for the home. I do not demerit Bible readings. It is a book which will do a great amount of good. Publishing Ministry, page 355, paragraph 2. She wrote that in 1889, one year after it came out. Brothers and sisters, this book was so popular within Adventism that they had put together, many heads came together to give the prominent doctrines of our messages in this book. That this book was being sold and pushed more than the great controversy. The prophet said not to do that, that the controversy, great controversy was the book they were to push. But she said this book would do great good. And in there is a chapter called the Eastern Question. And number 13 tells us Turkey is the king of the north. Just like the 1904 uh, Sabbath School Quarterly. Where else do we find these teachings? We do not believe that Russia is the king of the north. It is our opinion that any power that reigns over Syria is for the time being the king of the north spoken of Daniel 11. Hence, that the Turkish dynasty is now that power. If Russia, Austria, England, or France should become possessed of supreme power over Syria, which is the area where Turkey is, 
then it whichever it might be would become the king of the north till then none but the turkish dynasty occupies that position in our opinion and this is where constantinople was which is called istanbul today and notice that was written in december of 1854 james white was the editor he didn't write the article but if you look at the quote it says we and in the red it says it is our opinion our is plural we is plural the general view of the seventh-day adventist church was that turkey was the king of the north let's keep going and ARSH is Adventist Review and Sabbath Herald which of our pioneers believed that Turkey was the king of the north we're gonna look at a list of names Uriah Smith J.N. Loughborough Stephen Haskell Percy McGann, E.J. Wagner, A.T. Jones, A.G. Daniels, the General Conference as a whole, and Uriah Smith, uh, we're counseled to read his book. He talks a lot about the Eastern question, which we'll be looking at momentarily. Loughborough was the man raised up to go from church to church to teach the rise and progress of the Third Angel's message. Stephen Haskell, she said, um, was a man that God was using to teach our messages and that he was grounded in all of the truth and then Percy McGann he helped start the uh, educational system according to the blueprint Percy and McGann started I believe it was the Madison School E.J. Wagner and Jones they were the men who did righteousness by faith who else agreed with this position? Sister White. She said Uriah Smith and Daniels were correct on this position. They taught um, Turkey was the king of the north in their eastern question. And we're going to be looking at what they taught in just a moment. She endorsed them. Just go in the pioneer section of the CD-ROM and type in king of the north and look at what they taught read all the references James White was already deceased at this time in the 1880s when all these men were in agreement when he was still alive he was the only one who spoke against his teaching and sister White rebuked him for it ask for the document on this if you'd like to read the whole story now we're going to be reading about this uh, history of what happened. One of the testimonies to individuals delivered most likely only in oral form was addressed to James White, a reproof for his course of action just before the combined camp meeting in September 1877 in the general conference session. He and Uriah Smith held conflicting views on the prophecy of the King of the North pictured in Daniel 11 and the power presented in verse 45 that would come to his end with none to help him. White, in his Sabbath morning address, September 28th, in the newly pitched camp meeting tent, countered Smith's interpretations. He felt that Smith's approach, indicating that the world was on the verge of Armageddon, would threaten the strong financial support needed for the rapidly expanding work of the church. And that was in Biography, Volume 3, page 96, paragraph 4. We're going to continue on to read more about this. Ellen White's message to her husband was a reproof for taking a course that would lead the people to observe differences of opinion among leaders and to lower their confidence in them. For the church leaders to stand in a divided position before the people was hazardous. James White accepted the reproof, but it was one of the most difficult experiences he was called to cope with, for he felt he was doing the right thing. Biographies, Volume 3, page 97, paragraph 1. And notice why she gave reproof. It was for taking a course that would lead the people to observe differences of opinion among the leaders. James White 
was teaching contrary to the general view, and we'll be looking at that in just a moment. Note, if Ellen White rebuked James White for speaking contrary to what another leader of the church was saying and how it would cause confusion, why didn't she do the same to Uriah when he spoke on the Eastern question at this camp meeting in September 1877 if it was contrary to what the leaders of the church were teaching at that time? She actually said what Uriah taught at that camp meeting was of special interest. And you can read about this in Testimonies to the Church, Volume 4, page 279, paragraph 1. James White said he himself was actually the one that was speaking contrary to the general view on this subject, and not the other way around. There are some to sustain their position that the papacy is the king of the north, they're saying that Uriah Smith's position was contrary to the general view, and James White's position that the papacy was the king of the north was actually the general view. And this is false. Brothers and sisters, I have the documentation on this. We're also going to read what James White, he himself said, and if you'd like this document, just ask for it in the comment section of this video. Here's what James White says. Positions take upon, taken upon the Eastern question are based upon prophecies which have not yet their fulfillment. It may be said that there is a general agreement upon this subject and that all eyes are turned toward the war now in progress in 1877 between Turkey and Russia as a fulfillment of that portion of prophecy which will give great confirmation of faith in the soon loud cry and close of our message. Now notice he says there is a general agreement upon this subject of the Eastern question which deals with Turkey and they were looking at verse 45 of Daniel 11 as about to be fulfilled when this war was taking place but God held the winds in check Christ said hold 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 because the church wasn't ready but this was the event that they were looking at as being the fulfillment of verse 45 you can find that in the Advent Review and Sabbath Herald and the abbreviation for this is A R S H it's in volume 50, number 22, November 29th, 1877, page 172. And according to the prophet, God will not raise one man here or there to speak contrary to what the body or the church has established. And if you go to Ephesians 1, 22 and 23, I'm going to go there, Ephesians 1, 22 and 23. And whenever you're watching these presentations on YouTube, be sure to always have your Bibles. Ephesians 1, verse 22 and 23. I'm reading where it says, And hath put all things under his feet, and gave him to be the head over all things, to the church which is his body. So, God is not going to raise up one man over here and one man over there to speak contrary to what the church, the Seventh-day Adventist church body, has established as truth. James White was one man who was speaking contrary to this. I believe Uriah Smith did at one time, but then later he changed his position. God has not passed his people by and chosen one solitary man here and another there as the only ones worthy to be entrusted with his truth. He does not give one man new light contrary to the established faith of the body. Counsels to Writers and Editors, page 45, paragraph 2. Brothers and sisters, some are saying God had the rest of the men silent and only James White really was teaching this truth. Brothers and sisters, that's false. God isn't going to raise somebody to speak contrary to what the body is saying. The whole body agreed 
that it was Turkey that was the king of the north, not the papacy. James White was the only one teaching that. And this is why Sister White rebuked him because it was causing disunity among the brethren. And it was causing confusion with the newcomers. Now let's go to Daniel 11, 45 to 12, 1. And he, Turkey, shall plant the tabernacles of his palace between the seas, which is the Mediterranean and Black Seas, in the glorious holy mountain, which is Jerusalem. Let's go to Daniel 9, 16 to see this. Daniel chapter 9 and verse 16. It tells us the following. It says... O Lord, according to all thy righteousness, I beseech thee, let thine anger and thy fury be turned away from thy city Jerusalem, thy holy mountain. And I'm going to stop right there in the verse. Jerusalem, literal Jerusalem, was the holy mountain. And today it's still declared the holy mountain because that's where Christ stepped foot. Yet he, Turkey, shall come to his end, and none shall help him. Turkey had been helped over and over by England, Russia, Prussia, and other countries, but none shall help him when this happens. So when Turkey leaves Constantinople, where its headquarters is, and takes its headquarters and removes it to Jerusalem, okay, in the holy mountain, then we know that probation is about to be over, and then he's going to come to his end, and none shall be able to help him. Now we will be reading from Daniel and the Revelation, the 1897 Correct Edition, pages 333 to 339. And there is the link. So you, when you go to that link, copy and paste that link, and then type in at the very top, page 333. That's the PDF page number. That's not the physical book number. So make sure that you type in page 333 and read all the way from page 333 to 339. And I have copied and pasted it in this presentation, so we will be looking at that in just a moment. Okay, you might want to put this video on pause right now and take a little break. We're going to be getting into um, our reading of Daniel and Revelation, dealing with Daniel 11, verse 45. Uh, it's quite a few slides, so you might want to take a break at this time. And then when you do come back, make sure you put up the link that was just provided, copy and paste it, and then go to page 333. Okay, we're going to go into our reading for today. Daniel 11 verse 45 and he shall plant the tabernacles of his palace between the seas and the glorious holy mountain yet he shall come to his end and none shall help him we have now traced the prophecy of the 11th of Daniel down step by step and have thus far found events to fulfill all its predictions it has all been wrought out into history except this last verse so according to Uriah Smith and other pioneers as well in their writings the only verse that had not been fulfilled was verse 45 now brothers and sisters there are people saying oh yes these verses have been repeated and they're now verses 3 2 and 3 I believe the three kings dealing with Persia they're now saying it's the United States and Trump a lot of things are being spiritualized Brothers and sisters, the only verses she said would be repeated of this prophecy was verses 30 and th through 36. Okay? However, we're going to continue on. The predictions of the preceding verse, we're at the bottom of this page, the predictions of the preceding verse, verse having been fulfilled within the memory of the generation now living, which he wrote that in 1897, we are carried by this one past our own day into the future. For no power has yet performed the acts here described. But it is to be fulfilled, and its fulfillment must be accomplished 
by that power which has been continuously the subject of the prophecy from the fortieth verse down to this forty-fifth verse and in your own time please go read what he wrote regard verses forty to forty-four if the application to which we have given the preference in passing over these verses is correct we must look to turkey to make the move here indicated and let it be noted how readily this could be done palestine which contains the glorious holy mountain the mountain on which jerusalem stands between the seas the dead sea and the mediterranean is a turkish province and if the Turk should be obliged to retire hastily from Europe, he could easily go to any point within his own dominions to establish his temporary headquarters, here appropriately described as the tabernacle, movable dwellings of his palace, but he could not go beyond them. The most notable point within the limits of Turkey in Asia is Jerusalem. Now when Uriah wrote this, it was possible but up until November of this past year, 2016, it has not been possible for several decades. And we're going to read what the United Nations just ruled on behalf of the Muslims uh, and the Holy Mountain. So let's continue on. And mark also how applicable the language to that power, he shall come to his end and none shall help him, this expression plainly implies that this power has previously received help. And what are the facts? In the war against France in 1798 to 1801, England and Russia assisted the Sultan. In the war between Turkey and Egypt in 1838 to 1840, England, Russia, Austria, and Prussia intervened in behalf of Turkey. In the Crimean War in 1853 to 1856, England, France, and Sardinia supported the Turks. And in the late Russo-Turkish War, the great powers of Europe interfered to arrest the progress of Russia. And without the help received in all these instances, Turkey would probably have failed to maintain her position. And it is a notorious fact that since the fall of the Ottoman supremacy in 1840, the empire has existed only through the sufferance or allowance of the great powers of Europe. Without their pledged support, she, Turkey, would not be long able to maintain even a nominal existence. And when that is withdrawn, she must come to the ground. So the prophecy says, the king comes to his end and none help him and he comes to his end as we may naturally infer because none help him because the support previously rendered is withdrawn have we any indications that this part of the prophecy is soon to be fulfilled as we raise this inquiry we look not to dim and distant ages in the past whose events so long ago transferred to the page of history now interest only the few but to the present living moving world and this was in 1897 are the nations which are now on the stage of action with their disciplined armies and their multiplied weapons of war making any movement looking to this end all eyes are now turned with interest toward turkey and we read in 1877 that was happening that's what james white also said and sister white said so 20 years later the eyes are still there all eyes are now turned with interest toward turkey and the unanimous opinion of statesmen is that the turk is destined soon to be driven from europe some years since a correspondent of the new york tribune writing from the east said russia is arming to the teeth to be avenged on turkey two campaigns of the russian army will drive the turks out of europe carlton formerly a correspondent of the boston journal writing from paris under the head of the eastern question said the theme of conversation during the last week has not been concerning the exposition but the eastern question to what will it grow will there be war 
What is Russia going to do? What position are the Western powers going to take? These are questions discussed not only in the cafes and restaurants, but in the corps legislative. Perhaps I cannot render better service at the present time than to group together some facts in regard to this question, which according to President excuse me, which according to present indications are to engage the immediate attention of the world. What is the Eastern question? It is not easy to give a definition, for to Russia it may mean one thing, to France another and to Austria still another, but sifted of every side issue it may be reduced to this, the driving of the Turk into Asia and a scramble for his territory. Now, before I read the next portion, the reason why having the correct edition of this book is so important is because of all this information on the Eastern question. It has been removed from the 1912 and the 1944 editions. So, and the 1897 so-called edition on the CD-ROM is not the correct edition. It claims 1897, but if you go to the fourth from the last paragraph under Daniel 1145, you'll see it talking about 1908. So how can it be the 1897 edition when Uriah Smith died in 1902? And this is the 1897 edition. It can't be talking about 1908 for 1908 had not come yet. And what is the whole Eastern question about? The driving of the Turk into Asia, meaning the western part of Asia, which used to be called Asia Minor. Remember, Turkey dwells in Eurasia. The eastern part of Europe, which used to be called Thrace, and the western part of Asia, which used to be called Asia Minor. And this is called Eurasia, also known as Constantinople, also referred to as Istanbul. So when, it, it re, when it's driven out, and there's a scramble for his territory of Constantinople. Again, he says, we're at the bottom, surely the indications are that the Sultan, that's the head of the Ottoman Empire of Turkey, is destined soon to see the western border of his dominions break off. So the western border of Constantinople is the eastern part of Europe. And Europe wanted Turkey out, and they still do today. We're going to look at powerful uh, articles later on. Piece by piece, but what will follow? Are Romania, Serbia, Bosnia, and Albania to set up as an independent sovereignty together and take position among the nations? Or is there to be a grand rush for the estate of the Ottoman, which is Constantinople? But that is of the future, a future not far distant. Shortly after the foregoing extracts were written, an astonishing revelation, revolution took place in Europe. France, one of the parties, if not the chief one, in the alliance to uphold the Ottoman throne, was crushed by Prussia in the Franco-Prussian War of 1870. Prussia, another party, was too much in sympathy with Russia to interfere with her movements against the Turk. England, a third, in an embarrassed condition financially, could not think of entering into any contest in behalf of Turkey without the alliance of France. Austria had not recovered from the blow she received in her preceding war with Prussia, and Italy was busy with the matter of stripping the Pope of his temporal power and making Rome the capital of the nation. A writer in the New York Tribune remarked that if Turkey should become involved in difficulty with Russia, she could count on the propped assistance of Austria, France, and England. But none of these powers, nor any others who would be likely to assist Turkey, were at the time referred to in any condition to do so, owing principally to the sudden and unexpected humiliation of the French nation, as stated above. Russia then saw that her opportunity had come. 
she accordingly startled all the powers of europe in the fall of the same memorable year eighteen seventy by stepping forth and deliberately announcing that she designed to regard no longer the stipulations of the treaty of eighteen fifty six and that had to do with the crimean war you could read in i believe dealing with verse forty of daniel eleven in uriah's book this treaty concluded at the termination of the crimean war restricted the warlike operations of russia in the black sea but russia must have the privilege of using those waters for military purposes if she would carry out her designs against turkey hence her determination to disregard that treaty just at the time when none of the powers were in a condition to enforce it the ostensible reason urged by russia for her movements in this direction was that she might have a sea front and harbors in a warmer climate climate than the shores of the baltic but and here's a picture of peter the great we'll be learning more about him in just a moment but the real design was against turkey thus the churchmen of hartford connecticut in an able article on the present european medley states that russia in her encroachments upon turkey is not merely seeking a sea frontier and harbors lying on the great highways of commerce unclosed by arctic winters but that with the feeling akin to that which inspired the crusades she is actuated by an intense desire to drive the crescent from the soil of europe so that was her whole motive russia's motive this desire on the part of russia has been cherished as a sacred legacy since the days of peter the great that famous prince becoming sole emperor of russia in sixteen eighty eight at the age of sixteen enjoyed a prosperous reign of thirty seven years to seventeen twenty five and left to his successors a celebrated last will and testament imparting certain important instructions for their constant observance the ninth art ninth article of that will and joined the following policy so peter the great who ruled for 37 years from 1688 to 1725 before his departure he left a last will and testament that gave left certain important instructions for their constant observance now let's look at this to take every possible means of gaining constantinople and the indies for he who rules there will be the true sovereign of the world excite war continually in turkey and persia establish fortresses in the black sea get control of the sea by degrees and also of the baltic which is a double point necessary to the realization of our project and this is why they've been sending out their submarines they're trying to get control accelerate last two words accelerate as much as possible the decay of persia which is in the east penetrate to the persian gulf re-establish if possible by the way of syria the ancient commerce of the levant advance to the indies which are the great depot of the world once there we can do without the gold gold of england the eleventh article reads interest the house of austria in the expulsion of the turks from europe and quiet their dissensions at the movement of the conquest of constantinople having excited war among the old states of europe by giving to austria a portion of the conquest which afterward will or can be reclaimed and you do not want to miss the end of this because i'm going to be showing you articles something that happened just a few months ago where austria did something that is going to cause turkey to be kicked out of europe of the eastern part of europe fulfilling what uriah said would happen here continuing on the following facts in russia history russian history will show how persistently this line of policy has been followed in 1696 peter the great wrested the sea of azov from the turks and kept it next catherine the great won the crimea some say crimea 
Now, I've heard of Peter the Great, and I've heard of Catherine the Great, but I never who knew who they were. Now I know they were the leaders of Russia. In 1812, by the Peace of Bucharest, Alexander I obtained Moldavia and the prettily named province of Bessarabia with its apples, peaches, and cherries. Then came the great Nicholas, who won the right of the free navigation of the Black Sea, the Dardanelles, and the Danube, but whose inordinate greed led him into the Crimean War, by which he lost Moldavia and the right of navigating the Danube and the unrestricted navigation of the Black Sea. And the Dardanelles have to do with the territory also. It's the lower end of where the Bosphorus is that Turkey controls. This was no doubt a reverse repulse to Russia, but it did not extinguish the designs upon the Ottoman power, nor did it contribute in any essential decree, degree to the stability of the Ottoman Empire. Patiently bidding her time, Russia has been watching and waiting, and in 1870, when all the Western nations were watching the Franco-Prussian War, she announced to the powers that she would be no longer bound by the Treaty of 1856, and it was talking about the Western nations of Europe, which restricted her use of the Black Sea. And since that time, that sea has been, as it was 1,000 years ago, to all intents and purposes, a mere russicum, San Francisco Chronicle. Napoleon Bonaparte well understood the designs of Russia, and the importance of her contemplated movements. While a prisoner on the island of St. Helena, in conversation with his governor, Sir Hudson Lowe, he gave utterance to the following opinion. In the course of a few years, Russia will have Constantinople, part of Turkey, and all of Greece. This I hold to be as certain as if had already taken place. All the cajolery and flattery that Alexander practiced upon me was to gain my consent to effect that object. I would not give it, foreseeing that the equilibrium of Europe would be destroyed. Once mistress of Constantinople, Russia gets all the commerce of the Mediterranean, becomes a naval power, and then God knows what may happen. The object of my invasion of Russia was to prevent this by the interposition between her and Turkey of a new state, which I meant to call into existence as a barrier to her eastern encroachment. So this is regarding what Napoleon was stating. Kossith also took the same view of the political board when he said in Turkey will be decided the fate of the world. The words of Bonaparte quoted above in reference to the destruction of the equilibrium of Europe reveal the motive which has induced the great powers to tolerate so long the existence of the continent of a nation which is false in religion, destitute of humanity, and a disgrace to modern civilization, referring to Turkey. Constantinople is regarded by general consent as the grand strategic point of Europe, and the powers have each sagacity or jealousy enough to see or think they see the fact that if any one of the European powers gains permanent possession of that point as Russia desires to do that power will be able to dictate terms to the rest of Europe this position no one of the powers is willing that any other power should possess and the only apparent way to prevent it is for them all to combine by tacit or express agreement to keep each other out and suffer or allow the unspeakable Turk to drag along his sickly Asiatic existence on the soil of Europe. This is preserving that balance of power over which they are all so sensitive. But this cannot always continue. He shall come to his end and none shall help him. The sick man seems determined to reduce himself most speedily to such a degree of offensiveness that Europe will be obliged to drive him into Asia as a matter of safety to its own civilization. And Turkey was doing things in Uriah's day as he wrote this 
that was sickening Europe, where they wanted Turkey out of Constantinople, but they hadn't come to the time where they decided it was time to get them out. Well, we're going to look at articles in a little bit of today, 2016, late 2016, early to mid-2017, where Europe wants Turkey out or is getting fed up with Turkey. Let's continue on. When Russia in 1870 announced her intention to disregard the Treaty of 1856, the other powers, though incapable of doing anything, nevertheless, as was becoming their ideas of their own importance, made quite a show of offended dignity. A Congress of Nations was demanded, and the demand was granted. The Congress was held and proved, as everybody expected it would prove, simply afar so far as restraining Russia was concerned. The San Francisco Chronicle of March 1871 had this paragraph touching the Eastern Question Congress. It is quite evident that, as far as directing or controlling the action of the Muscovite government is concerned, the Congress is little better than a farce. England originated the idea of the Congress simply because it afforded her an opportunity of abandoning, without actual dishonor, a position she had assumed rather too hastily, and Russia was complacent enough to join in the little game, feeling satisfied that she would lose nothing by her courtesy. Turkey is the only aggrieved party in this dexterous arrangement. She is left face to face with her hereditary and implacable enemy, for the nations that previously assisted her, ostensibly through friendship and love of justice, but really through motives of self-interest, have evaded the challenge so openly flung into the arena by the northern colossus. It is easy to foresee the end of this conference. Russia will get all she requires. Another step will be taken toward the realization of Peter the Great's will, and the Sultan, that's the head of Turkey, will receive a foretaste of his apparently inevitable doom, expulsion from Europe. From that point, the smoldering fires of the Eastern Question continued to agitate and alarm the nations of Europe, till in 1877 the flames burst forth anew. On the 24th of April in that year, Russia declared war against Turkey, ostensibly to defend the Christians against the human barbarity of the Turks, really to make another trial to carry out her long-cherished determina determination to drive the Turk from Europe. The events and the results of that war of 1877 to 1878, called the Russo-Turkish War, are of such recent date that the general reader can easily recall them. It was evident from the first that Turkey was overmatched. Russia pushes her approaches till the very outposts of Constantinople were occupied by her forces. But diplomacy on the part of the alarmed nations of Europe again stepped in to suspend for a while the contest. The Berlin Congress was held January 25, 1878. Turkey agreed to sign conditions of peace. The conditions were that the Straits of the Dardanelles should be open to Russian ships, that Russians should occupy Batum, Kars, and Erzurum, that Turkey should pay Russia 20 million sterling, nearly 100 million dollars, as a war indemnity, and that the treaty should be signed at Constantinople. In making this announcement, the Alejamin Zitung, I don't know how to pronunce that word, forgive me, Zitung, added the eventual entry of the Russians into Constantinople cannot be longer regarded as impracticable. Now before I continue reading on, I know this is a lot of information, so go back and read this again. We're not finished with all the reading, but take notes. Um, write down key points so that you can memorize it because the more I read it the more I realize I remember it I remember what wars took place when with Turkey what those wars were called and what happened during those wars 
the Detroit Evening News of February 20th, 1878, said, according to the latest version of the peace conditions, Turkey, besides her territorial losses, the surrender of a few, and there's a map of Turkey, you'll see Turkey at the bottom and Russia at the top, as a matter of fact, if you look at the 1888 Bible readings for the home, you will see a picture of Russia as the bear getting ready to pounce on Turkey. Russia being a little higher than Turkey, a little more north. Now, why is Russia not called the king of the north? Because it doesn't occupy the territory of Constantinople, and that's what this is all about, Russia wanting to get that territory from Turkey. Let's continue on. Ironclads, the repairs of the mouth of the Danube, the reimbursement of Russian capital invested in Turkish securities, the indemnity to Russian subjects in Constantinople for war losses, and the maintenance of about a hundred thousand prisoners of war will have to pay to Russia, in round figures, a sum equivalent to about five hundred fifty two million dollars in our money. The unestimated items will easily increase this to six hundred million. With her taxable territory reduced almost to poverty stricken Asia Minor, and with her finances at present in a condition of absolute chaos, it is difficult to see where she's going to get the money, however ready her present rulers may be to sign the contract. So when the countries of Europe were coming to her protection again, they put stipulations as to what Turkey was to do with Russia, how much to pay Russia, what territory to give Russia. The proposition amounts to giving the Tsar a permanent mortgage on the whole empire and contains an implied threat that he may foreclose at any time by the seizure of the remainder of European Turkey. In this last aspect, all Europe has a vital interest in the matter, and particularly England, even if the conditions were not in themselves calculated to drive England, English creditors crazy by destroying their last hope of ever getting a cent of their large investment in Turkish bonds. It makes Russia a preferred creditor of the bankrupt port, with the additional advantage of being a signee in possession, leaving creditors with prior claims out in the cold. The following paragraph, taken from the Philadelphia Public Ledger, August 1878, sets forth an instructive and very suggestive exhibit of the shrinkage of Turkish territory within the past 60 years and especially as a result of the War of 1877. So around 1830s to the 1890s, the territory of the Ottoman Empire, which Turkey was control of, okay, had shrunk. They, they, they controlled a lot more territory in Europe than they now did in 1897. They only had this little portion in Eastern Europe before they had areas in Spain and England and many other areas of Europe. Anyone who will take the trouble to look at a map of Turkey and Europe dating back about 60 years, so this is 1897 going back 60 years, 1837, and compare that with the new map sketched by the Treaty of San Stefano as modified by the Berlin Congress, will be able to form a judgment of the march of progress that is pressing the Ottoman power out of Europe. Then the northern boundary of Turkey extended to the Carpathian Mountains and eastward of the river Sereth. It embraced Moldavia as far north nearly as the 47th degree of north latitude. That map embraced also what is now the Kingdom of Greece. It covered all of Serbia and Bosnia. But by the year 1830, the northern frontier of Turkey was driven back from the Carpathians to the south bank of the Danube, the principalities of Moldavia and Wallachia being emancipated from Turkish domination and subject only to the payment of an annual tribute in money to the port. South of the Danube, the Servians had won a similar emancipation for their country. Greece also had been enabled to establish her independence. 
then as recently the Turk was truculent and obstinate and we're going to learn the troubles Turkey and Greece are having today or Germany I should say then as recently the Turk was truculent and obstinate Russia and Great Britain proposed to make Greece a tributary state retaining the sovereignty of the port this was refused and the result was the utter destruction of the powerful Turkish fleet at Navarino and the erection of the independent kingdom of Greece thus Turkey and Europe was pressed back on all sides now the northern boundary which was so recently at the Danube has been driven south to the Balkans Romania and Serbia have ceased even to be tributary and have taken their place among independent states Bosnia has gone under the protection of Austria as Romania did under that of Russia in 1829 rectified boundaries give Turkish territory to Serbia Montenegro and Greece Bulgaria takes the place of Romania as a self-governing principality having no dependence on the port and paying only an annual tribute even south of the Balkans the power of the Turk is crippled from Rumelia is to have home rule under a Christian governor and so again the frontier of Turkey and Europe is pressed back on all sides until the territory left is but the shadow of what it was 60 years ago to produce this result has been the policy and the battle of Russia for more than half a century for nearly that space of time it has been the struggle of some of the other powers to maintain the integrity of the Turkish Empire which policy has succeeded and which failed a comparison of maps at intervals of 25 years will show Turkey and Europe has been shriveled up in the last half century so since 1847 1840s it is shrinking back and back toward Asia and though all the powers but Russia should unite their forces to maintain the Ottoman system in Europe there is a manifest destiny visible in the history of the last 50 years that must defeat them a correspondent of the Christian Union writing from Constantinople under date of October 8 1878 said when we consider the difficulties which now beset this feeble and tottering government referring to Turkey in the East the only wonder is that it can stand for a day aside from the funded debt of one million one billion dollars upon which it pays no interest it has an enormous floating debt representing all the expenses of the war its employees are unpaid its army has not been disbanded or even reduced and its paper money has become almost worthless the people have lost heart and expect every day some new revolution or a renewal of the war the government does not know which to distrust most its friends or its enemies and like 46 years later or uh, 46 years later in 1924 it became a democracy but as of last year it's no longer a democracy let's keep going since 1878 the tendency of all movements in the east east of Europe has been in the same direction foreboding greater pressure upon the Turkish government in the direction of its expulsion from the soil of Europe the occupation of Egypt by the English which took place in 1883 is another step toward the inevitable result and furnishes a movement which the independent of New York ventures to call the beginning of the end in 1895 the world was startled by the report of the terrible atrocities inflicted by the Turks and Kurds upon the Armenians and that was in 1895 we're gonna see what Turkey's doing and Ottoman or Islam with Turkey's doing in Europe today with all those bombings reliable reports show that many thousands of these Armenians have been slaughtered with every circumstance of fiendish cruelty the nations through their ambassadors protest and threaten the Sultan promises but does nothing so the Sultan of Turkey he promised he would do something about the slaughters of the Armenians but nothing was done 
He evidently has not the disposition, if he has the power, to stay the tide of blood. Fanatical Muslims. Now let's see this, because I'm going to show you a quote where she says, histories of the past are going to be repeated. They're going to become uh, up on the scene again. Now look at this. Fanatical Muslims, okay, in Europe, we're doing all this destruction. Are there fanatical Muslims today? Yes. And we're going to find that, how that's a part under the third woe. Fanatical Muslims, which these days was also under this. Fanatical Muslims seem seized with a frenzy to destroy all the Armenian men and take their wives and children to slavery or a more lamentable fate. At this writing, January 1897, thousands of widows and orphans are said to be wandering in the mountains of Armenia, perishing of cold and hunger, and they stretch out despairing hands to England and America to save them from total destruction. And this explains why there's so many Armenians in America, and especially where I grew up as a child. I grew up in a city in California called Glendale, and that has a high population of Armenians. It did in the 70s and the 60s. And now I understand why because America allowed these Armenians to come in because of what the Turks were doing to them in Europe when they were in the European area and in other territories. And this is, you know, so this really rings a bell in my mind because I was around a lot of Armenians growing up. Okay, continuing on. A thrill of horror has run through Christendom. And a cry is rising from all lands. Let the Turk be driven out and come to his end. And yet the selfishness of the nations, talking about the nations of Europe, because remember, they don't want another country of Europe. Each country of Europe doesn't want another country of Europe to get their hands. So they're allowing Turkey to be there. Okay, and their jealousy of each other restrain their hands from arresting this what does that say? Carnival of slaughter and ruin by unseating the terrible Turk. How long, O oh Lord, how long? Thus all evidence goes to show that the Turk must soon leave Europe. Where will he then plant the tabernacles of his palace? Palace meaning his headquarters of government? In Jerusalem. That certainly is the most probable point. Newton on the prophecies, page 318, says between the seas in the glorious holy mountain must denote, as we have shown, some part of the holy land. There the Turk shall encamp with all his powers. Yet he shall come to his end, and none shall help him, shall help him effectually or deliver him. Time will soon determine this matter, and it may be but a few months now. God held the winds in check because when that happened that was a sign that our high priest in the most holy place was about to finish his work and stand up which meant probation would have closed and you have to understand at this time they were pushing for Sunday enforcement in 1888 in 1892 President Harrison signed it and by 1906 between 1892 1897 it was already being enforced and I can get you that quote if you'd like it just ask for it in the comment section below this video so here you have the Sunday issue on the scene and here you have this issue with Turkey so to God's people in those days it was about to be a wrap but they had rejected the righteousness by faith message and God's people were not ready so Christ again puts his hands up and says hold 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 he did this in the 1840s he did this in the 1870s he's doing this in the 1890s okay so God had to do something to put this prophecy in check in 1917 Russia became part of the uh, what is it called um, USSR and in 1924 Turkey became a part of the they became a democracy they were no longer a caliphate with the caliph at the head so the prophecy couldn't be fulfilled well in 1989 Russia is no longer a part of the USSR and of last year Turkey is no longer a, uh, a democracy 
their caliphate now. And now they're trying to make President Erdogan of Turkey the head of the Ottoman Empire, trying to gather all these Muslim groups together. So this history is being repeated. Okay, so let's continue. Time will soon determine this matter, and it may be but a few months. It wasn't a few months. And when this takes place, what follows? Events of the most momentous interest to all the inhabitants of this world, as the next chapter immediately shows. Read Stephen Haskell's book, Story of Daniel the Prophet. Okay, page 246 to 248 powerful. In the front of that book, when you open the front cover, it says that comes from his Bible training school that he held. Uh, he started in 1902 in New York City. If you read Evangelism, page 111, paragraph 2, you can see where the prophet endorsed what he taught at that Bible training school. He, he is lining up with what Uriah is saying here as a second witness. Note, since the foregoing was written, the situation in Turkey has grown continually worse. Armenian massacres have continued and between January and September 1896, rebellion against the Turk broke out in Crete and Macedonia. Besides this, fanatical Muslims themselves show signs of dissatisfaction with the Sultan and threaten revolution. Serious disperse, disturbance has just taken place, September 1896, in Constantinople, resulting in the slaughter, and that was just four months prior to him writing this. In Constantinople, resulting in the slaughter of some 2,000 Armenians, the crown heads of Europe are now in consultation in regard to the disposition of the affairs of Turkey, with the prospect that some determination will be reached and thus the only obstacle in the way of the dissolution of the Turkish Empire be removed. So here we see, brothers and sisters, what the Eastern question is all about. And towards the end of this video, we're going to be looking at some powerful articles of events that are going on between Turkey and the countries of Europe. Okay, you might want to put the video on pause right here so you can take a little break. Perhaps go get yourself some water or some fresh air and even get a little bite to eat before we continue into the last portion of this video. Okay, we're going into the last portion of the video. Sister White and Dorsey Uriah Smith's teaching on the Eastern Question. We read details of what this subject was in his book. Elder Uriah Smith spoke on the subject on the Sabbath question to a large congregation this morning. And this evening he speaks on the Eastern Question. I feel so grateful that Brother Smith is not lost to the cause. He seems fully and thoroughly united with us. Seems like Brother Smith of old. Oh, thank the Lord. So notice he was speaking on the Eastern question. She says he's not lost to the cause by speaking on this subject. And he seems fur fully and thoroughly united with us like Brother Smith of old. So if I'm not mistaken, Uriah Smith spoke against Turkey being the North. At one time he was in agreement with James White, but he came around to seeing the truth of the message when the events were taking place. This was written in 1884, 13 years before he wrote the book, Daniel the Revelation, the 1897 edition. And that was 13 years after this quote, and a lot more events took place giving more credence to the subject of the Eastern Question. And this is the year, this is three years after James White died in 1881. And now she's giving endorsement to Uriah Smith, an open public endorsement. The evening meeting was largely attended. 
Elder Smith spoke with great clearness, and many listened with open eyes, ears, and mouths. The outsiders seemed to be intensely interested in the Eastern question. He closed with a very solemn address to those who had not been preparing for these great events in the near future. So, not only does he teach on the Eastern question, he speaks with great clearness, and many are listening with their eyes open, their ears and mouth. So what does it mean when your mouth is open? You're in awe, you're in shock of what you're hearing. This is the subject that the outsiders really came for. There was thousands of, upon thousands who came to the campground. And according to the prophet, these e great events were going to take place in the near future. She's endorsing this subject. Now, she doesn't go into detail of what the Eastern question is, but as we read in the book, we saw what it was about. But there was a uh, journalist there from the paper Worcester Daily Spy. And I have the actual article, and if you would like this article, just put a comment in the box below the video, and I'll let you know how you can get this article. But in here, it goes into detail of what Uriah Smith taught regarding the Eastern question and the events that were taking place in 1884 when he taught at the camp meeting. Okay, let's keep going. You can find those two quotes that I just posted by going to egwwritings.org. It should just be egwwritings.org. And in the tep lo top left search bar type in Eastern question and quotation marks and you'll find these or you can copy and paste the link that you see right there and it'll take you directly to the quotes when you click the link go to paragraph 6 and 7 and you can you can actually click the link you'll find the quote there okay I found these by going to the top left search box I typed in Eastern question then hit enter there are about seven quotes about this subject, but these two quotes I'm sharing in the previous slide are not found on the E.G. White CD-ROM, only found on the new releases at egwritings.org. Okay, these were not released from the Ellen White estate until July 2015. And God is good because he didn't want his mouth prophet to look like a false prophet. These were not released until two months after these things started to repeat in our day. In 1919, our church still took the stand that Turkey is the king of the north. So, when Turkey didn't feel, fulfill the events of this prophecy, our church took a stand that they still believe Turkey was the king of the north. And if you would like this article, just ask for it and I'll be more than happy to give it to you. Okay, and this is what it says. In 1919, our church took a stand stating that even though movements with Turkey were slowing down, as a church we were not to change our position that Turkey is the king of the north. And if we see in their day that God's people were to look for it being fulfilled in the future. And so, as I said before, SSR, 1924, Turkey becomes a democracy, and so God held the winds in check. But 1989, Russia is no longer a part of the USSR, and since last year, Turkey is no longer being a democracy. They are turning back into a caliphate. And remember Miller's fourth, uh, 13th rule? If the prophecy doesn't take place, either look for another event or wait for this to take place in the future. And that's exactly what the church said that they were going to do. Now the article that you can read this in is found in, let me just tell you real fast, I'm sorry. It is in the Review and Herald article, January 13th. 1919. Let me just read it. We see no reason at the present time for departing from the view we have held for years regarding the exposition of Daniel 11. 
we have seen no new interpretation so they didn't go along with James White's in our judgment that is superior to the old we believe that the conclusion held by us from the beginning of this movement is that Turkey represented by the term King of the North in the prophecy is correct and because just at this present juncture in the affairs of this world there seems to be no immediate prospect that Turkey will plant her palaces at Jerusalem is no reason why we should change our view of the question if we cannot see then it is best to wait and bide God's time for the fuller light and watch him work things around as we believe his word reveals that he will and now since 2015 these things are now happening okay if you'd like that article from the Advent Review and Sabbath Herald from our church feel free to ask for it go to the following link and go to page 3 actually here's the link in the far right column last paragraph on page 3 to page 4 on the top left there's the link now here's some of the articles we'll be going over the Eastern question is back this is according to the BBC which is from Europe from their newspaper and if anyone knows what the Eastern question is all about dealing with the Eastern of Europe it would be the Europe the nations of Europe number two Erdogan says he and Muslims will invade Jerusalem number three Turkey and European Union to end affair number four Austria Turkey should not be allowed to join the EU Turkey threatens to flood Europe with 15,000 Muslims every month number six Turks in Germany not allowed to vote on death penalty issue number seven President Erdogan calls on world's Muslims to invade Jerusalem number eight United Nations declares Holy Mountain is Muslim not Jewish so here's the first article Turkey the Eastern question is back that's what the article looks like February 26 25th 2016 from the section Europe BBC this is last year history has a strange way of imposing itself upon the present and remember we read she said histories of the past would be repeated that that controversy was going to come back back in the early 1990s when I was on my way to join the first British troops dispatched for peacekeeping duties to Bosnia I stayed overnight at a Vienna hotel in the lobby there was a series of 19th century maps of the Habsburg Empire there they were all of the old names Bosnia Herzegovina Herzegovina the Croat lands names long consigned to the history books that were now the currency of nightly news reports marking out the boundaries of this latest tragedy in the Balkans later standing in Sarajevo's old Turkish market one had the clear sense of being in a historic border zone a frontier between Europe and the old Ottoman lands to the east it was a reminder that for much of the 19th century Western diplomacy in 19th century is the 1800s Western diplomacy had been obsessed with what became known as the Eastern question brothers and sisters they were connecting Turkey to being the part being in the east eastern part of Europe and being a part of the eastern question here's another article president of Turkey Erdogan aims to invade Jerusalem there he is May 2015 this article came out two years ago nothing in the Western media covered what the Turkish Anadolu agency released when Turkish president Recep Tayyip Erdogan it's not Erdogan it's Erdogan gave a speech this Friday with a strange message riddled with statements that were predicted in the Bible regarding Antichrist from his desire to invade Jerusalem and to Muhammad's claim to have ascended to heaven from there Erdogan called on all Turks to refocus on the Ottoman goal 
to reconquer Jerusalem for Islam. And remember, the sign is when Turkey leaves Constantinople and takes its headquarters to Jerusalem. So now in May 2015, he's saying this. In July 2015, the endorsements from Ellen White regarding Uriah Smith on this subject, they surface. And that wasn't a coincidence. Turkey and European Union to end affair. By Céline Girit, BBC News, that's a British news in Istanbul, because Istanbul is a part of Europe, 22nd of November 2016, we're told the European Parliament will vote this week on whether to suspend Turkey's talks on joining the EU, and the Turkish government is giving a good impression of looking the other way. And they rejected Europe, and we'll see why they rejected. In April of 2016, Austria said Turkey should not be allowed to join the EU, the European Union. Remember we read in Uriah's writings that Peter the Great told Russia to convince Austria to get Europe to kick Turkey out? Well, remember he's coming to his end and none shall help him? If Turkey's not a part of the European Union, Turkey can get kicked out of Europe. There's the president of Austria, or the leader, and he said this in April 29th of this year. Austrian Chancellor Christian Kern says Turkey should not be allowed to join the European Union with membership talks between the EU and Ankara at a standstill. So scratch 2016. This is 2017. So look what the repercussions was as a result. So European Union tells Turkey no. Look, let's, let's see what happened next. Turkey threatens to send Europe 15,000 refugees, most being Muslim, a month. So this is their payback. This is their retaliation. And here you see lots of Muslims being taken over. March 17, 2017, Istanbul, Turkey's interior minister, Suleyman Soylu, has threatened to blow the mind of Europe by sending 15,000 refugees a month to EU territory in an intensifying dispute with the bloc. So in March they were saying, if you don't allow us, we're going to send 15,000 Muslim immigrants a month, or 15,000 refugees, and most of them would be Muslim. So what's been going on in Europe? All of these bombings, all of these attacks. If you go on YouTube, the Muslims have taken over major portions of England and Britain, many areas of Europe. The Europeans are frustrated, they're furious, and they want to get Turkey out. Turks in Germany not allowed to vote on the death penalty. So, we looked at reasons why Turkey would be kicked out. Now let's look at reasons why Turkey would leave on its own. Just recently, they had a death penalty uh, vote, and Turkey was not allowed to vote. Because you know, as a caliphate, they want to bring the death penalty back. Okay, there's the picture of them when they were voting. They were not allowed to vote on this subject. May 9, 2017, Berlin Reuters. Turks living in Germany will not be allowed to vote in any referendum or rein on reinstating the death penalty in Turkey. Chancellor Angela Merkel said in remarks broadcast on Tuesday. In order for them to be able to do their caliphate, their country as a caliphate, they have to have the death penalty. So this may cause them to want to leave. Germany allowed Turks to vote last month in a referendum that endorsed broad new powers for President Tayyip Erdogan. But many local authorities banned campaign rallies, something Erdogan compared to Nazism, causing a diplomatic rift. So this is causing problems. Burqa bans. Muslim women can't wear veils in many European countries, especially the burqas. Okay, and this is part of their religion for many of these Muslims. Erdogan urges all Muslims to visit and protect Alaska in Jerusalem. 
There's Alaska. And if you read Story of Daniel the Prophet, page 247, paragraph 1, we'll be talking about Dome of the Rock. There's two mosques in, in um, the Holy Mountain in Jerusalem. We'll be learning about that in just a moment. July 25th, 2017, Turkish President Recep Tayyip Erdogan on Tuesday, this was just a month and a half ago, urged all Muslims to visit and protect Jerusalem after violence broke out over metal detectors Israel installed and later removed from a sensitive holy site in the city. From here I make a call to all Muslims. Anyone who has the opportunity should visit Jerusalem. Al-Aqsa Mosque, Erdogan said in Ankara. Come, let's all protect Jerusalem. He was referring to a site known to Jews as the Temple Mount, which is central to the Israel, Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Jerusalem Holy Site declared Muslim, not Jewish, in United Nations. Okay, so that holy mountain was declared in November, October or November of 2016, by the United Nations to belong to the Muslims and not the Jews and we'll find out why in just a moment. October 15, 2016, here's what the article said. One of the world's most important religious sites and Judaism's holiest site, Jerusalem's Temple Mount and Western Wall was called an exclusively Muslim shrine Thursday in a United Nations draft resolution that denies Jewish connection to the site. In 70 AD, here's a little history about this site. In 70 AD, that territory was destroyed and taken from the Jews by the Romans. By Stephen Haskell in his book, Crossing its Shadow, it says the temple remained standing, the Jewish temple, until 70 AD when it was destroyed by the Romans. Today, the sacred spot is covered by a Mohammedan mosque. Not the Al-Aqsa, but the Dome of the Rock, which we'll see in just a moment. It wasn't until 1798 by Napoleon that the Jews were granted permission to once again dwell in this old territory. And if you click that link, you'll be able to see this history. See also Genesis 15:18 regarding what territory this was. Let's go to Genesis 15:18. Genesis 15:18 tells us the following In the same day the Lord made a covenant with Abram saying Unto thy seed have I given this land from the river of Egypt which is Nile unto the great river the river Euphrates Okay So all that territory the Jews were now to have back by that time, 1798, the Muslims had two mosques, one Dome of the Rock, which was built in 691 A.D., and Al-Aqsa was built there in 705 A.D. that had been in that very spot for over a thousand years by 1798. So remember, from 70 A.D. until 1798, 1800s, the Jews were not dwelling in that area. The Muslims were. And they have two, two mosques there. The Dome of the Rock is considered their second most holiest mosque. And Al-Aqsa is their third most holiest mosque. Both are at the Holy Mountain in Jerusalem. And their first most holiest mosque is in Mecca. And the reason why they want to go to Jerusalem put their headquarters there is they believe Jesus Christ they don't believe he's the son of God but they believe he's a prophet and he's coming to kill the devil and bless their temples and they want to be present when he does this and it wasn't until 1843-44 that the Sultan of Turkey gave them permission to build a synagogue and worship there and if you go to March 1850, The Present Truth by James White, 
which Sister White tells us in CET 128.1 that this article was present truth. Okay, so the Sultan giving them permission in 4344 to go back and build a synagogue, this was the end of the Gentiles in that area. The Jews were now allowed to go back. In reviewing our past history, this is from Jesus through the prophet, having traveled over every step of advance to our present standing, I can say praise God. We have nothing to fear for the future, except as we shall forget the way the Lord has led us and his teaching in our past history. Last Day Events, page 72, paragraph 1. Brothers and sisters, we cannot forget this past history, this teaching. And now the, the subject of the Eastern question is back. Again and again I have been shown that the past experiences of God's people are not to be counted as dead facts. We are not to treat the record of these experiences as we would treat a Lasher's almanac. The record is to be kept in mind for history will repeat itself. And as I said, this old history of the days of the pioneers and Sister White in the late 1800s is now repeating itself. That's pastoral ministry. No, Publishing Ministry 175, Paragraph 3. Links to the articles. If you click each of these links, you'll be able to come up to those articles. Here's more links to the articles. Just click each one of them individually so you can read these for yourselves. And here's more links to the articles. Well, this is on a video, so you'll have to copy and paste it. But if you would like the actual PowerPoint, I'll send it to you. Sister White also endorsed what Elder Daniels taught on this subject of the Eastern Question. Elder Daniels speaks this evening upon the Eastern Question. May the Lord give His Holy Spirit to inspire the hearts to make the truth plain. And This was written in 1898. He spoke at the camp meeting in 1898. And if you would like to see what the journal is, because the newspaper, once again, was at our camp meeting. Because the only church that was talking about the Eastern question and connecting it to end time events was the Seventh-day Adventist church. And in 1898, the Geelong was there, the Geelong Advertiser. And if you'd like this article, I'll send it to you as well. But they tell you what Daniels was teaching. And it was basically the same thing Uriah Smith taught at the 1884 camp meeting. But now 14 years have passed, and this subject was getting more intensifying. The events were getting more intensifying. Here's a link to this quote. It's the top paragraph. The above portion is toward the end of the paragraph. There's the link. It's paragraph 9, where it starts off with saying, God alone can make the impression. So notice she calls this subject the truth. And she prayed the Holy Spirit would make it plain. Daniels has two books on this subject. One is called A World in Perplexity. And the second one is called The World War. It's relation to the Eastern Question and Armageddon. I have both of these books and this was dealing with World War I and the events surrounding them and how the Eastern Question was connected. In both of these books, there is a entire chapter on this subject alone regarding the Eastern Question. And here's the links to read the books online, the particular chapters. Go to page 93 of the first link to read the subject on the Eastern Question. And go to page 49 of the second link below to also read the subject on the Eastern Question in this book as well. Question. What about those who come in with new theories on this subject, contrary to what the Seventh-day Adventist body already agreed upon? The enemy of souls has sought to bring in the supposition that a great reformation was to take place among Seventh-day Adventists and that this reformation would consist in giving up the doctrines which stand as the pillars of our faith. Were this reformation to take place, what would result? 
the principles of truth that God in his wisdom has given to the remnant church would be discarded. The fundamental principles that have sustained the work for the last 50 years would be accounted as error. Books of a new order would be written. First Selected Messages, page 204, paragraph 2. This was written in 1904, so the last 50 years from when this was written would take us back to 1854. In December 1854, the church body declared that Turkey was the king of the north. In 1877, Sister White said that which Uriah Smith taught on the Eastern question was a subject of special interest. In 1888, she called it truth, or she said the events connected to it that Uriah taught on regarding the Eastern question would come to pass in the near future. In 1898, she said what Daniels taught on this subject was truth. And I have many articles, year after year, that our church taught the Eastern question included Turkey being the king of the north. And all of this information is between 1854 and 1904. Anything coming in, tearing away, saying contrary, such as Lewis Weir's book that teaches contrary to these messages that have been established, and in the 1800s, late 1800s, she said Uriah's book was correct. 1901, she talked much about that book. All of this falls under the last 50 years. When any person comes with some new theory of that which he calls new light, I tell him I know he has not the truth. I refuse to go into an argument with those who oppose the truth, but call their attention to the publication of the truth given me, which has been written under the Holy Spirit's representation. If they will carefully read Great Controversy, the Testimonies for the Church, Patriarchs and Prophets, Desire of Ages, and all the many books that are in circulation, that bear testimony to the truth given at varied times and in varied places over a period of half a century, they would not be entering into temptation and walking in false paths, false paths where some are today. And this is from the new releases, egwwritings.org. This was written in 1906. Written in 1906. Remember, we have been told that Uriah Smith's book, the correct 1897 edition, is the book to read to understand the prophecies of Daniel and Revelation. The people in the world need to know that the signs of the times are fulfilling. Take to them the books that will enlighten them. Daniel and the Revelation, the great controversy, patriarchs and prophets, and the desire of ages should now go to the world. The grand instruction contained in Daniel the Revelation has been eagerly perused by many in Australia. This book has been the means of bringing many precious souls to a knowledge of the truth. I know of no other book that can take the place of this one. It is God's helping hand. Brothers and sisters, she says this book is God's helping hand. She knows of no other book. Take to the people now. Let not those who have been placed in responsible positions such as teachers, Sabbath school teachers, and ministers, and our teachers in our schools, think that God has given them light to controvert the work of the faithful ones who have died in the faith. God wrought through these old pioneers of the cause, and no voice or pen should be brought into action to demerit their labor. 9MR 132, paragraph 3. Any questions? If you have any questions, you may, number one, post them in the comment section below this video, or number two, send your questions to cbiblical at yahoo.com. The end. We've reached the end of our presentation. Thank you so much for joining. Please go back re-listen, look up the verses, look up the quotes, and don't miss part four.